schedule. This is Marsha Hoffman and Jerome Radcliffe. They're going to do their talk on encryption passwords and data security, which you can see on the big screens. If you don't mind, you'll give a big round of applause. We'll kick this off. And I'm going to get out of here and have a good time. Can you hear me all right? Is this okay? All right, thanks for coming today. My name is Marsha Hoffman. I am a senior staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And I am also a non-residential fellow at the Stanford Center for Internet and Society. Uh, what I work on at EFF is general digital civil liberties. And so I'm interested in uh, rights that you have against the government uh, in computers, mostly. I'm interested in privacy, free expression, and what have you. And um, I'm going to ask my co-presenter to come up and introduce himself. So I'm uh, Jerome Radcliffe. Um, only if I'm in legal trouble, call me Jerome. If you see me in the hallway and you say, hey, Jerome, I probably will just keep walking. Uh, so I go by Jay. Um, I do a lot of computer security research, have for the last 12 or 13 years, Worked work for a major uh, computer security company that doesn't really want me to say their name anymore. Um, I have a master's degree from SANS Technology Institute. I also have my undergraduate in criminal justice pre-law, and I spent a lot of time flirting the line between doing legal stuff, thinking about becoming a lawyer, and continuing down the technology path of being a hacker. Um, so a lot of times I get dragged in to talk to the lawyers because everybody's too scared to talk to them. But I spent a lot of time trying to look at how legal decisions and how legal issues can shape our policy in the IT world. That's a lot of what we're going to try and talk about here today. So Jay and I met at DEF CON a few years ago, and we realized that we both had this interest in passwords and the legal situation around passwords. And um, we thought it would be fun to do a talk here at ShmooCon about passwords. And it's going to have two phases. First, I'm going to talk about the law that applies in a situation where the government tries to force you to disclose your password or your encryption passphrases or force you to turn over a decrypted version of data. And um, building on that, Jay is then going to talk about what that actually means when the rubber hits the road and how that is uh, a consideration that could inform uh, IT policies for companies, um, giving guidance uh, to users uh, as they're trying to choose a good password, and um, some of the things that uh, we should consider when we're thinking about the legal protections that we have and what might actually uh, not be protected by the law. So first, I'm going to talk about the law. I'm going to talk very specifically about the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which gives you the right to remain silent. And the um, particular right that we're talking about today is um, the, the right to not be forced by the government to be a witness against yourself. This is something that um, is a long enshrined value in the United States, and the courts have looked at it over the course of many, many, many years. And the rule that the courts have come up with is this basic rule. The government cannot compel a witness to make a self-incriminating testimonial communication. So this is a test that has three parts. There are three considerations. The government has to force you. The thing that you would be revealing has to be incriminating to yourself. And it has to be a testimonial communication. And we're going to talk a little bit in a, in a moment about what those things mean. We'll flesh it out a bit. Um, why do you think we have this rule? Does anybody have an idea why we have this rule? Why do we have this constitutional right? Where does it come from? What do you think? Torture. Torture. That's exactly right. This is, this is where this comes from. This comes from the days when uh, governments actually used to torture people to make them confess or give up information. And this is why we have this rule, because the government is not allowed to make you give information about yourself. Um, the way that the courts talk about it, they say, uh, if we didn't have this rule, then somebody who had incriminating information about himself would be in a really tough position with no good answers. The person could either give up the information against himself so that the government could prosecute him, or the person could lie, which is a crime in and of itself, and you could, you could be prosecuted for that. Or if you just decide that you're not going to give up the information, then a judge can hold you in contempt and throw you in jail. And you just don't have any good recourse there, and we have this right to make sure that nobody's in that situation. So that's the type of interest that we're trying to protect. So 
A few things about the privilege against self-incrimination. This is something that is sometimes, I think, kind of hard to wrap your head around. Um, and it's very, very particular to the circumstances uh, that, that each person finds himself in. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to really explain uh, any sort of a bright line rule, like this is when you would have this and this is when you would not have this privilege. Uh, for one thing, uh, this is a privilege that only protects against government attempts to compel testimonial evidence. And what I mean by testimonial evidence is stuff that's in your mind that you would have to articulate. Uh, if you were to give up this information, that would say something in and of itself about you and uh, your control over certain information. Um, this is not, this, what, what this doesn't mean, what this means is, okay, what this does not mean is that you have a right uh, not to turn over stuff that just happens to be evidence in, in your possession. The government can still force you to turn over documents if they can um, actually identify the documents. Um, what the interest, uh, what the, the protected interest you have is in um, you know, turning over information that, that is actually like in your, in your mind. That's, that's the interest. It doesn't apply to tangible evidence that already exists. Fingerprints, papers, blood samples. Again, you know, the, the idea is that giving up that information, that's just evidence. It doesn't reveal anything about the contents of your mind. But here's the kicker. It can apply to an act of production that has testimonial aspects um, that would confirm the existence, possession, your, your possession, your control over something, or the authenticity of it. And that's where this gets interesting when we talk about passwords and uh, encryption passphrases. A few other things. This privilege can only be invoked by the person who has the interest. And, and that's very important. So like, you can't, you can't invoke the privilege to protect information about your friend that you know. Um, if, if the information is incriminating to you, then uh, that's, that's the interest we're trying to protect. Again, um, the Fifth Amendment isn't available to companies. And so if an employee has information that might incriminate the employer, then the, the Fifth Amendment doesn't apply in a situation like that. Um, something that's very interesting about the Fifth Amendment is that the Supreme Court has made really clear that it's meant to protect the innocent as well as the guilty. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, you, wouldn't you only invoke this if you, if you were guilty? Or wouldn't, you know, if you invoke it, doesn't that basically mean that you're guilty? And um, the Supreme Court has made clear that that's not the case. Even innocent people can have a right against self-incrimination. Um, what does incrimination mean? Does anybody have a sense? Incrimination means that the government might charge you with something. So it doesn't mean that you're guilty of it, it just means it could lead to you being prosecuted for something, okay? And um, innocent people can be prosecuted for things that they're not guilty of, right? So that makes sense. Um, one thing that the Supreme Court has said is that basically what, it's, what this privilege is intended to do is ensure that you won't be ensnared by ambiguous circumstances. That's, that's the term. So there are some situations where you can lose your privilege against self-incrimination or you just don't have it. And there are two big exceptions that, that I want to talk about. The first is the government can overcome your privilege against self-incrimination by granting you immunity. And uh, it doesn't have to go so far as to grant you immunity uh, from prosecution for that offense, um, but they have to grant you immunity uh, that ensures that they can't use the evidence against you or anything that they learn as a result of having that evidence um, against you in a subsequent, uh, subsequent prosecution. Now, if they can learn it some other way, they, then they can use it against you. But, hold, hold on one second. Um, if they can use it against you, then, um, okay, if they, can if they find it some other way, they can use it against you in a circumstance like that. But uh, if, you, if, you know, if you give it to them, um, then that's not something they can introduce to prosecute you. And the reason for this is because once they give you immunity, then the information is no longer incriminating. And that's why it doesn't apply. The other, the other big thing is what's called the foregone conclusion doctrine. And um, this gets back to the idea that what you are disclosing 
uh, is something that, that reflects the contents of your mind and rather than just physical evidence in your possession. If the police already have a pretty good idea that there is evidence uh, that exists and that it's in your possession and um, they can describe it with some specificity, then the privilege may not apply. And the idea, you know, what the courts have said about that is like basically in a situation like that, you're just surrendering evidence. You're surrendering something that already exists and they already know it's there and there's nothing testimonial about that. And um, I think that this is potentially problematic, um, but we'll talk about that uh, in a moment. So there are not a whole lot of cases uh, that apply the Fifth Amendment um, uh, privilege against self-recrimination uh, in the context of, of attempts to force disclosure of passwords. Um, the first time this came up was in a case called United States versus Boucher. This involved a situation where a man was driving across the border from Canada into the United States and he had a laptop in the back seat and um, border agents stopped him and wanted to search uh, the interior of his car and they saw this laptop and um, it happened to be on and he showed them uh, some stuff. With his permission, they, they looked at the contents of some of the files and they saw what they thought might be child pornography. And so they seized the computer, shut it down, and later when they tried to uh, look at those files again, what they found was that they were in an encrypted drive. And so they asked a court um, to force them to turn over the password. And uh, a magistrate judge, which is you know, a fairly low-level judge, about as, as, as low as a judge can be, and judges are, of course, wonderful people. I don't mean that in any sort of derogatory way. Um, but the magistrate judge said, well, I don't think you can force them to disclose the password because that's protected by the Fifth Amendment, privilege against self-incrimination. You know, that would reveal that he had possession and control over that stuff. And so you can't do that. And so the government came back and said, all right, all right, all right, fine. But what if uh, we just compel him, or you judge compel him, to turn over uh, an unencrypted version of that data? And um, the judge was like, okay, that I'm going to allow. And the reason I'm going to allow that is because the agents, the government agents had already seen the stuff. They looked at it, they knew it was there. They knew about the existence of this evidence and they knew the location in this drive and so we're going to say that's a foregone conclusion. It's a foregone conclusion that that stuff is there, no Fifth Amendment privilege. So that is, uh, that remains the most uh, fleshed out uh, case on the books and that's the one that's the most instructive. There have been a couple since then, uh, United States versus Kirshner and uh, this, this one, uh, the, the last one there I just learned about recently, earlier this week, it's an unreported decision um, anybody guess what these all have in common? Child, child porn. Yes, they're all child porn cases. Um, this is one thing that, that's bad about, uh, about criminal law, I think, is that often um, these really important uh, decisions are made in cases that have really bad facts. And judges often, I think, have a gut feeling about what the result ought to be, and they will make sure that that's the result. And you know, I, I think that in cases involving child porn, it's, it's very difficult to make good law and have good rules. Um, and so I was very pleased that United States versus Kirshner, uh, again, a judge was like, you can't compel somebody to disclose a password. Boom, end of story. Um, that last case um, was a little, uh, a little dicier. That involved a situation where a government employee um, had files on his work computer that appeared to be porn, child porn. And um, without much analysis, the judge just said, well, I, I, I think it's a foregone conclusion. Like, they, they knew that those files were there. Boom, that's the end of the story. So uh, this, the foregone conclusion doctrine has been kind of the, the biggest sticking point here. Um, you all may have heard about a case called United States versus Fricozu in uh, Colorado. Uh, there was a decision that came out in that case just earlier this week. How many of you have heard of this? It's been in the news. All right, cool. Um, this is a case that we think is very interesting. This involves a situation where a woman was uh, charged with mortgage fraud related things. Uh, her former husband was uh, charged with the same stuff, their co-defendants in this case. And the police 
seized uh, several computers from her home, and, including a laptop that was encrypted. They were not able to unencrypt the laptop. Afterward, she had a conversation on the phone with her ex-husband, co-defendant. He happened to be in jail for unrelated things, and the conversation, because he was in jail, was recorded. And in this conversation, she says things that vaguely suggest that there might be some stuff on that encrypted laptop that uh, the government might be interested in seeing, and she's not going to turn over the password. And um, so the government tried to compel her to disclose the password, or in the alternative, an unencrypted version of the data. And uh, she challenged that, said, I have a Fifth Amendment right not to do that. We filed an amicus brief supporting that, uh, pointing out that encryption is a very important thing for privacy and security, and it's becoming increasingly common, and it's very important that uh, the courts recognize Fifth Amendment right in this thing. And we said that, uh, in, in our opinion, she had a valid, strong Fourth Amendment right. The government had offered her immunity to try to get rid of that privilege, but only a very limited immunity. And we said, we don't think that that's enough, A. And B, we don't think that the fact that she vaguely referred to something on the computer that the government might find interesting, uh, specific enough to lead to the conclusion that finding you know, evidence of a crime there is, is a foregone conclusion. The judge earlier this week uh, disagreed. Uh, the judge said that because they seized the laptop from her home and um, there was uh, some identifying information on the laptop that uh, makes it likely it's hers and because she had this conversation with uh, her former husband on the phone that was recorded, um, that her uh, privilege did not apply. Um, one thing that I find very odd about the opinion, and I'm not sure exactly what to make of it, is that while the judge said that her, um, that, that there wasn't a, a valid Fifth Amendment right that was touched in this case, um, he kind of suggested that she might have some kind of a Fifth Amendment right here because he points to the fact that the government offered her immunity and basically orders the government to observe that and actually make good on that promise. So I'm not quite sure what to make of that. I mean, that, that may be an implicit decision by the judge that there is some kind of a Fifth Amendment right here that, that he is trying to protect. But on the whole, because she, you know, had this conversation with her husband, uh, the, the judge said, look, it's a foregone conclusion that they're going to find bad stuff on that computer. Um, it's clear from the circumstances that, uh, that, it, that it was hers, and they don't need to um, introduce evidence of her uh, act of production in order to show that it was her computer. So we're, we're, it's a foregone conclusion. That's it. So we think the judge got it wrong. Uh, this is a district court uh, decision. So as far as court decisions go, it's fairly low level, and it is likely to be appealed. And I think that's a very, uh, a very good thing. One thing about this case that I really like, well, it doesn't involve child porn, that's great. There's a second thing about this case that I think is, is really good, which is that if on appeal, um, the, the appeals court decides that she loses along the same lines as, uh, as the judge here, the reason she lost is because she had this conversation with her ex-husband. And that is not going to be the situation in most cases. That's a very, that's something that's a, a random fact that's very specific to this case and is very important here, right? I mean, just like in the Boucher case where uh, this guy had actually shown these files to the government, in most situations that's probably not going to be what, what's happening there, right? So. If this turns out to be a bad result, I think it's a bad result because of something very specific to that case, and it's not going to have implications for everybody in this room, most likely. It's not going to lead to a really broad bad rule, is my, is my hope. On the other hand, if on appeal we win this, I think it's going to establish a, a pretty good broad rule. So it's sort of like, I feel this case is good because it's hard to, it's hard not to have, you know, you can lose the case, but it's not going to create a really bad rule, I think in the long run, even if the case is lost. So, so that's my take on Frikozu. So here's something that's important to understand about passwords. Um, if the government is trying to compel you to turn it over, 
then, you know, and it's in your brain, then you may have a valid Fifth Amendment right in that, all right? Now, if you write it down on a piece of paper, it's a record that already exists, and that's a different situation. In that case, you may not have a valid Fifth Amendment right that you would have otherwise had. And we can talk about whether, you know, the act of turning that over is an act of production that might be protected and what have you, but if it is in your brain, that's a stronger legal position uh, to be starting from. And so um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to, to Jay, and he's going to talk about what this actually means in practice. Well, before I do any talking about that, I, this is a good spot to ask any questions. So if you have any questions specifically that you can answer, that, that might be a good spot to do it. Actually, if it's OK, I'd rather wait till the end, okay. because some, some feedback I got from Shumacon last year is that I indulge you all too much. And so I'm afraid <laughs> that if we start, uh, it, we're just, it's going to be crazy, and you're never going to get to talk. So okay. just talk. Fair enough. All right, so this is all great information, and it's very interesting. But one of the things that I find in my line of work and in our line of work is that you know, we see these big cases that come out legally, and then we go into the office, and maybe we run into a customer, an executive, or an executive from the company we work with, and they're like, hey, I read this case. Uh, you know, it's kind of computer related. What's that have to do with me? And those questions can be really hard to answer sometimes. Sometimes companies, executives, want to have some advice uh, you know, based upon these, these decisions, based upon these media reports that have legal components to them. And from a technology perspective, we need to adapt to that. We need to look at how we can, can strengthen our positions in, uh, in regards to these things. So obviously there's this relationship between law and policy, right? We, can, we, we look at our IT policies, we look at our security policies, and we say, you know, we should do this. Uh, you know, and some of those things are based upon law, some of those things are based on security. And this is one of those cases where they overlap. You know, all of us here have dealt with password policies, right? Um, so you have to kind of look at, we had a, you know, a great discussion about what the Fifth Amendment does to our passwords. How do we look at them? Uh, you know, how are they impacted by this? Because one of the things that, that Marcia didn't mention was that let's say the government seizes your computer, okay? And they have this TrueCrypt container or some type of encrypted files. And they say, would you please give us your password? And you say, no. I plead the fifth. You cannot have my password. Well, the government doesn't just throw their arms up in the air. They will actively try and break into your encrypted file system, provided that they have the appropriate search warrants and stuff. So if you pick the password ABC123 for your encrypted container, and you say, I'm not giving you my password. And the government will just type in ABC123, and then they have the files. Now, all of that work you did is for naught. So really what this comes down to is password policies. So what are our password security concerns? Well, the first is the direct loss of passwords in plain text form, right? So they can be physically stolen. They can be insecurely stored. So let's say you put them in your, you got a web application, you store the database, or you store the password in the database in plain text. Well, that's not really good, right? Um, they could be sniffed off the network, either in plain text version or in a hashed version. Or we can have what I will label user incompetence, which is users picking, users taking their password, writing it on a post-it note, and sticking it on their keyboard or on their hand, or wherever else they feel like they won't lose it. The second password security concern is what, what is called entropy. So that's the number of possible characters. When we look to break passwords when we're doing security testing, we can kind of say, OK, you know, you run through the things. But if you know that it's always going to be a lowercase letter, there's no uppercase letters, then you're reducing that key space down. You can actually look at more passwords and attempt more passwords if there's a lower entropy and if there's a higher entropy, right? So we look at using special characters. We look at using numbers. We give this advice out, like, use special characters. It makes it harder to break your password. And it makes brute forcing those things password, or make brute, brute forcing them harder. The third security concern would be hashes, which is the encrypted form of a password, 
right? Now, this can be used to learn the plain text form of the password with a variety of tools, John the Ripper, Loftcrack, things like that, can take the hashes and break them and find a match so you can have the plain text password. Now, this is the most commonly, commonly used way to store passwords. You know, in all of our operating systems, we take the password, we hash it, and we store the hash. Then when you log in again, it types in the password, hashes it, then takes the hash and compares it to what it thinks your hash should be. And if it matches, it lets you in. If it doesn't match it, then you're not in. And this is the most commonly leaked version. You know, when we see 20 million passwords were stolen by, you know, anonymous, they're usually in hashed form, right? But because our users are mm, not greatest password pickers, um, you know, a lot of those, you know, in most cases, up to 50% of the user's passwords are very easily broken. To kind of give you an idea, there was a great talk at DEF CON this year that talked about the, the economics of breaking passwords with graphical processing units. And these are the kind of numbers that were talked about in that, in that presentation. Right now, with a modern desktop, you know, with computer parts that you can go to Best Buy right now and buy, you could break an eight-character password in two days little under two days. Um, now that, when I talk about all these numbers, I'm including the full scope of entropy, all 96 characters, special characters, upper, lower case, right? When you jump to nine characters, now we're talking about 100 days. 10 characters with that same system is over 400 years. Now let's take a look at the top 500 supercomputers. China has the number two and number three supercomputers. Um, a 10-character password on the, one of those systems would only take a day and a half. 12-character password would take 33 years. So we can see here that the length of the password is really kind of becoming really important because even adding a single character really has an exponential rate on how difficult it is to brute force that password and to crack it. So how does that relate to policy goals, right? We all know that users should pick good passwords. And I'm sure all of us here probably pick pretty good passwords and that we're aware of this. But we're tasked with the job all the time of getting our users or getting other people's users to pick better passwords. So what are our goals when we try and set a policy password or a policy recommendation? First, it's got to be easy to memorize, right? For security reasons, we don't want users to write down their password. Right? But now we have this added component. We have this legal thing that says, well, you know, if you write the password down in a document, it's not in your mind anymore. And that changes things legally. Now, it might not matter to companies, but it does matter to us in security. And when executives ask about these types of things in the media, this is something you can point to to say, well, that decision and the stuff that you read, maybe we need to update our password policy maybe we should put more emphasis on training our users to memorize those passwords and not to write them down, right? So based upon the cracking information that we know about, we're kind of pushing, and the policy recommendations that when I talk to my customers is more than 12 characters, and immediately they flip out. Oh my God, I can't memorize 12 character passwords. So we have going to have to deal with that in education, right? We also look at some increased entropy, right? Now, this is kind of, for me, it's more of a controversial topic, right? We see a lot of companies, we see a lot of, a lot of places that when you select a password, they would like you to select an uh, eight-character password with special characters and numbers and a capital letter, and trying to force the user to expand that entropy to make it harder. Um, and we have to look at proper storage in that policy. Not only do we have to have users pick secure passwords, even if your very good users have been re-educated, pick 20 character passwords with special characters, letters, and numbers, if you store them in the clear or transmit them in the clear, well, that doesn't do you a whole lot of good, right? But how do we accomplish this? Like I said, a big part of that is education, right? Our users have been drilled into their heads for years that passwords have to be eight characters long and they have to be random. And this is kind of a daunting task because you don't, you tell them, hey, 
Now, they've got to be 15 characters long. But you don't tell them about what kind of things can make a good 15 character password. So their immediate first thought is, oh my god, I have to memorize a 15 random character password with special characters. And that's where we have to re-educate them. We have to kind of debunk some of those myths, right? Users are stuck in a, in a mindset that they've been taught when we started password policies, you know, 10 years ago, which is random characters, it's got to be eight characters long, and don't use a word. God forbid you use a word. Oh my God, if you use a word, that's the end of the world. So when you start telling them, oh yeah, you know, you can pick a 20 character password and you can use words, they're like, wait a minute. You told me I couldn't use words. And then you kind of ask, well, we said don't use a word. But you can use words, multiple words. That's a lot easier to memorize. And, you know, we've, done, we've had a lot of success in going in and giving a half hour presentation, usually combined with a lunch or some other kind of incentive for the users to show up and talk to them about this. How do you pick a good password? Not only that, but now you're forcing them to change those passwords every 90 days. So you have to give them skills to be able to, to select passwords, skills to be able to pick passwords quite often and change them often. So that way they don't keep the same password for 10 years. So there's a lot of myths that our users have listened to us, but now times have changed. So we need to do some re-education and get them to understand that they can use words and it is easy to memorize a password. Probably a lot easier than memorizing eight character random passwords. The one problem that users really struggle with is forced entropy. They pretty much hate it. Um, some of them, some things less so than others, right? So when we started down this path, we tried to force entropy, right? You have to put, you, your password has to have a number. I don't care what you think, you have to have a number, right? Because you're forcing them to expand that window to make it harder on, you know, potential abuses for cracking. But now it's gotten a lot larger than that. Now we have companies that are like, well, to make it sure it's secure, we should, we should force full entropy, which would be they have to have a number, they have to have a special character, they have to have a capital letter. And that makes it harder for users. And you, when users run up against things that are hard, they will cheat. Right? If you make them put all those things in there, it's harder for them to memorize it and they are going to circumvent it. And they usually do that by writing the password down on their whiteboard, right in the cubicle, or on the post-it note. I and mean, we've all had those experiences. And we really have to focus on trying to make it easier for the user, not harder for the user. My suggestion is somewhat to do away with the entropy. The entropy isn't as much as the issue as the length now. Because graphical processors are so powerful, we look at the full scope of things and most of the password cracking tools, now you can limit their entropy, but by default, they're trying every character. They're trying special characters, they're trying capital letters, right? So when you're in a pen, when you're in a pen testing situation, you might look at the password policy and say, well, they force people to have numbers and special characters and capital letters. But that doesn't really change anything now, does it? Right? Because if you didn't have those rules, users could still use special characters, numbers, and capital letters. So you really can't change your strategy for breaking in or for doing a penetration test because the users have those abilities. So to make it easier on the users, we can force them to choose longer passwords, but give them more room to breathe with regards to these special characters. Because we all know that we can pick a secure password using all lowercase letters. Right? It's more, I hate saying this phrase, it's more about the length than, uh, than anything else. <sighs> um, so, you know, and I've seen some really horrible password policies. Uh, one that comes to mind is a company had a VPN password policy where they said it had to be eight characters long. No shorter, no longer. It could not end with a number. It had to end with a letter. And it had to have a minimum of two letters, or minimum of two numbers. And I was, I was like, well, and I'm going through my head, because all of us have a methodology for picking passwords. I'm like, eh, no, that doesn't work. Eh, that doesn't work. I was like, this is the worst password policy ever. I was like, if I, I'm not even I can pick a good password in this. It's pretty bad. 
You know, so we really need to, to evaluate these password policies and seeing what good they're doing. We also have to look at, like I said, storage options. This sounds really obvious, but when we look at these things, we can, like I said, we can give the user all the education we want, and maybe our users are super smart, intelligent, and they pick it up right away and pick great passwords. But if we store them incorrectly, if our applications that we're buying are storing them incorrectly, then if those things were to ever get out, then all of that effort is for naught. Right? So we need to take a little bit of time as professionals to maybe evaluate those applications. Or do we take it for granted and just assume that that new fancy web app we bought stores everything with SHA-1 encryption with SALT? We probably should look. Right? Is it, is it just base 64 encoded? Is it stored in the clear? Are you using SALTs? And for people who don't know what SALTs are, it's a little piece of information you can attach to the front which helps make it harder to encrypt, or it doesn't make it harder to encrypt, but it gives more encryption possibilities. Um, it's a little piece of information so that way, um, instead of just if you take the password and hash it, you would get a result. Well, if you have salt, then you would have to go through all the permutations of the salt. So instead of just caching it one time to find if you have a match, there's a lot larger potential. So it makes it harder to crack those passwords. So now one of the things that I think is really valuable here is we're going to take a look at some scenarios, right, that you might face personally, you might face in the workplace, and kind of take a look at them and reevaluate them and look at the information we've learned, uh, you know, in these court decisions about how they might impact them. Or let's say an executive comes up and says, well, how would our situation with our developers be impacted by this, for example? So the first one is... Uh, with KeePass. And KeePass is a great little program that allows you to save all your passwords and it keeps it an encrypted file. Um, you know, as system administrators, as people who have to have bazillions of passwords, it's just too hard to memorize all those passwords. Um, you know, sometimes we can do it, but a lot of times we'd like to have a backup method, right? So it's a password vault, it's encrypted, and it's protected with a password or passphrase. So you have like a master passphrase to get into your password vault. So, Marsha, what would we, I think that mic works up there. Is this, is this on? I don't think it is. I'll just, is it on? Yeah, no, we can share that. I don't bite. We can share, yeah. That hard. How many of you use KeePass? I use it. Do you use it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe LastPass is another one that's pretty popular. Yeah. Yeah, there's, they're all pretty much the same kind of. Product. I, I think KeePass is, is, is pretty great, and um, as much as I feel squeamish about writing down passwords because of the Fifth Amendment implications of it, if you have to write them down, I think it's a pretty good way to maintain that record because you have to have a password to access the record. And so, you know, I, I think Fifth Amendment protection is possible in that situation, and, and I think that that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Can we hold the questions till the end? We're, we're pretty close to it, and I'm sure there's a flood of questions. So we'll definitely, we'll definitely address all of them. Even if we go over, we can go into the back of the room or something. OK, so the second one that, that's pretty applicable is about two-factor authentication, right? And we're pretty familiar with this. Let's say you have one of those insecure, I mean, very secure RSE, RSAID tokens, um, right? And you need a pin plus whatever the, the token thingy says, right? So remember, we talked about physical things, right? Is it a blood sample or a key and a lot of these things with evidence? This little token is something that the government can say, well, give us that. That's part of evidence. And you don't have a Fifth Amendment to protect that. But probably have the pin can be protected, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Yeah, my thinking about that is the same. Um, in, in terms of the pin, I think Fifth Amendment protection is certainly possible. But the token, uh, not so much. You're not going to have anything there. This third one's a lot more complicated. And it's something that I've seen a lot of companies struggle with. And um, I, don't, I haven't seen any great solutions to it yet. But I'm sure somebody will become rich once they figure out how to do this, right? So let's say a third party company can hold the encryption key or have some other kind of key to access that encrypted data, right? So the company 
right? Wants to to be wants their wants their users to be secure, right? So we'll do full disk encryption. But you, as the company, you know, we don't completely trust the user, right? What if they go rogue? What if they what if there's an accident and that user has very important information to the company that the company would needs to exist? Their intellectual property is, you know, part of that laptop. But if only the user has the key and only the, the user did was a good user.